start their own business or anything like that. So job number one here is to get this economy going again for everybody. We are finally in a position to do that. I personally believe the president's done a better job than he gets credit for. But I want to explain what I mean by that. If you can go back 400 years, all over the world, it normally takes 10 full years at least to get over the kind of financial whipping we took on the crash. Now we got the jobs back early, but not the wages. There's way too much inequality and access to jobs, incomes, education, health care, the whole shebang. We have to address that. Because now, finally, we are in a position to grow together. And my argument for Hillary is pretty simple. I think she's got the best economic plan, the best college aid plan. I think she's got the best record as a change maker. And she's the only person left in either party who's basically spent a lifetime making changes that make people's lives better at home and had serious national security experience to guarantee it will be as safe as possible without giving up our value. So, <laughs> where the jobs are, first, Hillary calls for a major commitment to do two things, neither of which can be outsourced. Rebuild the infrastructure of America. Flint, Michigan is not the only place with elevated lead levels in the water and in children's blood. Cleveland does too. Wow. I was in Jackson, Mississippi, and they do too. She wants to spend enough money to tear up all the rusty pipes in America, lay new ones, give every child a healthy future, and create a ton of good paying jobs in the process. It's important. When I leave you, I'm going down to Chillicothe on my way to Dayton tonight. She's the first person to call for doing something extra to incentivize investment in coal country and the rest of Appalachia and every part of America that's been left out and left behind. Number one, give everybody in this country access to affordable rapid broadband and a lot of those people will create their own jobs because they'll be part of the national economy. Number two, give people extra incentives to invest in those areas. We had a modest program that gave up to 39% tax credits for people to invest in those areas and the Republicans let it die in the last Congress. We need to bring back that plus more. She's the first person in either party to call for doing something for Appalachia and other places that have been left out and left behind. And to say there is a connection between the places that are most distressed and the places with the highest rates of addiction to prescription drugs and heroin. And we should deal with them both, including, including treating this drug problem like a public health problem with more mental health and more treatment facilities. But you also have to give people something to look forward to when they get up in the morning. And she is committed to doing that. Second point, she wants to put up 500 million solar panels in the next four years and have everybody on their own clean energy within eight years. Everybody in the country. That'll create huge numbers of jobs and they can't be absent. Number three, she wants us to realize we've gained 900,000 manufacturing jobs since the crash and now we are in a position to produce far more modern products with advanced manufacturing than we have been in a long time for a simple reason. Manufacturing is the most productive sector of anybody's economy which means you can pay people good living and every year labor will be a smaller percentage of the cost and materials, energy, and transportation will be a bigger percentage. This is a simple equation. Since we got the biggest market in the world, save the transportation and build the stuff here. We can do that again if we find it. And what she proposes to do is to take these companies that have been misbehaving, at least I think they have, Pay Johnson Controls. It's a great company. My foundation worked with them to retrofit the Empire State Building. We created 275 full-time jobs and cut the energy use of the world's oldest big building to get a LEED certification by 40%. They did that with their technology. But their main business is an auto parts supply company. So what did they do? They came to Congress and they said, please give us the bailout. They got it. 
Yeah. What did they do then? He said, okay, thank you for your tax money. I'm taking my tax money to Northern Ireland because the corporate tax rate is a third as high. By pretending to be bought out by some t Nazi company and now allegedly owns us so we can pay taxes. She says if anybody else does that, they ought to pay an exit tax for getting out of America. And, and if you take tax breaks from the state of Ohio, from the city of Columbus, any other city, or from the federal government through the program that Hillary wants to bring back to create markets everywhere, and then you leave anyway, as soon as you get the tax breaks, you ought to have to give back the last five years of tax breaks. And then use those two funds to move jobs back to America. Give the breaks to people that want to put us to work, not put us out of work. Now, the last thing I want to say is you can't forget that two-thirds of the new jobs we've created in the last 20 years have come in small business. And the mayor just took me on this tour of Long Street in the new, the old new, beautiful auditorium. What Hillary wants to do is to make sure that the regulations for keeping Wall Street from wrecking Main Street again, which are the toughest we've ever had. I don't care what anybody running for any office says. What we've got on the books now is way stronger than anything we had for the last 20 years. The government can break up any kind of bank if they keep taking risks. It can find them. It can require them to keep more cash. But a lot of regulators around the country have applied those rules, which are expensive to comply with, to local banks, and they made it more expensive to make small business loans. So just think of wherever you bank. If some young person wants to go in and borrow fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to start a bank, if it costs as much to process a $60,000 job loan, as a $6 million loan, there'll be fewer $60,000 loans. Hillary wants to make sure that we regulate what we should regulate and let the small business market go again. We've got to get back in the top five in the world in small business formation. Now, we've got to get incomes up. The best way to do that is to recognize why they're not rising. The main reason is the labor markets haven't been tight enough and therefore not enough people are in the workforce. We're creating jobs now. We are no longer in the top 20 in the world in women in the workforce. Why? Because we're one of only seven countries that doesn't get any paid leave. Every man in this room should be for paid leave and equal pay so we can get more people in the workforce and people can succeed in raising their kids and working for a living and that will help us to grow this economy. that's killing this country's effort to reduce inequality is that companies that are publicly held, that is stock companies, have for 40 years been steadily moving toward giving more and more of their money to their stockholders and their top management and less and less to their workers and the communities. Now, from the 1930s through the dark ages when I finished law school, we all learned that corporations were not people <laughs> but creatures of the state. They got certain breaks for being corporations, like limited liability. In return for that, they had more or less equal responsibilities to their customers, their employees, their communities, and their stockholders. Then what happened? Because you only have to hold the stock a year and a day to get a capital gains rate, which is lower than ordinary income tax, you have all these activist shareholders they don't care if they wreck the companies. They don't care if they force layoffs in profitable divisions. Hillary thinks we should give companies that share their earnings with their employees in a significant way a big tax credit. And she thinks we should stop giving lower capital gains treatment in a year. If you take it out to three years, then there will be no incentive to force companies to spend all their money on their shareholders instead of reinvesting it. And guess what? The evidence is clear. People who invest in companies that take care of their employees and their communities are investing in companies that do better than most over any 10-year period 
Most of them do better over any five-year period. We need to go back to sharing the work and the welfare and the, the earnings that people make. None of these companies can make money if there wasn't somebody working there. And that's a big, big deal. Then we have to make sure that we educate and train a workforce that can do all this work. Beginning with one of these teachers. She believes we've overcomplicated this federal role in education. If you look at the best performing schools in the world, they all have two things in common. They have really good teachers that help each other get better, and they have principals that know what the heck they're doing. <laughs> you know, it's not rocket science. They also have a definable culture in every school, and it can be different from school to school depending on what the needs of the kids are. But she wants the education department to get back to supporting quality teaching and quality principles, and she believes that's the best way to raise student performance. Yeah. That's what they have done all over the world. Second thing is, she wants every student to be able to go to college, community college, an advanced training program, and emerge from it debt-free. Now, it's a big difference between debt-free and free tuition for everybody. And I think she's got the better side of the argument. Think Ohio, okay? The cost of college has exploded. It's gotten worse because state legislators, many governed by Republicans, have to give some money to the public schools constitution. And if they want to cut taxes and do other stuff, what are they going to cut? The colleges and universities. What are the colleges and universities going to do? Raise tuition and behave more like private schools. If you have tuition free for everybody, then all these legislators will think, oh goody, we can make them raise it some more. And pretty soon all the kids will be in trouble again with that. <coughs> what Hillary wants to do is say, look, if you need free tuition, we'll give that to you. And not just at public institutions, but at historically black colleges and universities and other small schools for first and second generation Americans. In, in public and private schools that keep their tuition modest and their graduation rate high. You should be able to qualify and get your tuition paid if you need it and get more help if you need it. But for upper income people, we should pay our own kids tuition because we're going to have to raise some revenues from higher income people, not because we resent them, but because that's where the money is. Only the top 16% of us have made any money in the last eight years. And that money ought to be used to put the rest of the American people to work in good paying jobs. We shouldn't be just recycling it to pay tuition. But if you have debt free tuition and debt free costs, you help the people that need tuition. If they need more, you help them. And then you give every student the chance to do 10 hours of work study a week. Guess what that does? They not only earn money, but it cuts the cost of operating the colleges so there will at least be some incentive to hold down a cost instead of explode them. I think her plan's better. Even more important is all this debt that's been already accumulated. She proposed to let graduates who have debt from whatever source, including graduate schools, do two things. One, refinance their debt, just like you can refinance a house. If you did that, college debt's the only thing you can't refinance. You know, it's the only loan. If we did that overnight, if we did it today, by tomorrow, 25 million Americans would save an average of $2,000 each at one thing. Then she believes we should let accumulated debt be treated like a home mortgage because a college education is a lifetime asset. So everybody should be able to convert it into a 20-year plan that you pay out as a low fixed percentage of your after-tax income so that nobody's going to be burdened by it. Kids can move out of their parents' home. <laughs> if, they took a, if they took a job just because they wanted to make debt payments and there's a job over here they love but pays less, they can take it now because their debt payment will go down. If they want to go to the bank and borrow that $60,000 to start a bakery, it won't count against their credit scores. It would just literally lift the burden off. And 
If they do three years in public service, they can get rid of the debt for life altogether. Otherwise, otherwise, at the end of 20 years, the debt's canceled, no matter how much they still owe. Look, this is a big deal. We have to do these things. If you want to have more jobs, raise incomes, and prepare people to do it. And she also covers advanced training programs and their costs. I was down in Louisiana the other day. We had a primary down there. And there was, she did pretty well. <laughs> the, uh, but anyway, I talked to a friend of mine from New Orleans. He said, just in that area, there were job advertisements for 7,500 welders. They all make good money. They're just not being trained to do the job. So we've got to do this. We've got to do it together. Now briefly, let me say, you know, my experience is, I've been working on this a long time. When I was a governor for 12 years, to the time I came to Ohio running for president, we led the country in job growth. We were one of only eight states that gained manufacturing jobs in the 80s. But it's hard work. It's easy to talk about change and want another thing to bring it about. When I was president, 95% of the people had higher income gains than they did when President Reagan was in office. Under the Bushes, they went down for Why? Because trickle-down economics and having no regulation on the finance system is a lousy growth strategy. The middle class incomes went up 70 times as much, 70% more. Working class, more than twice as much. The thing I'm proudest of, people whose incomes were at zero to the 20% bracket, their incomes went up 30 times as much. We moved 100 times as many people out of poverty. We can do this again. Yeah. But we got to have an economy that works for the struggling, the striving, and the successful. That's Hillary's phrase. <laughs> but wherever people are working together, good things are happening. Wherever they spend all their time fighting, good things are not happening. Wherever people would rather have short-term gain instead of long-term shared prosperity, good things are not happening. We got to do this together. So we have to remove all these other barriers. We need a sensible immigration reform, not promises to deport people and whether it would collapse the economy. We need a sensible program to reduce the number of nonviolent offenders that are being held in prison. But with all these educators here, we also got to make sure that they don't turn around and go back by giving them transition, education, and training, and job placement, and not letting people refuse to hire them because they just got out of jail. They need to be able to start again. We need equal employment opportunities for the LGBT community. Look at this. The gay rights movement is the fastest moving civil rights movement in American history. So we get to gay marriage, you get married on Saturday, you still be fired on Monday. That doesn't make any sense. We need to fix that. The disability community is the fastest growing consumer sector in America. Did you know that? And when placed in jobs for which they are trained according to their abilities, they have better average attendance, better average performance, better average productivity improvements than the workforce as a whole. We need to do this together. So it's not just the places that are left out and left behind. We can't leave any people behind. Yes. And if we do this, I am telling you, we can grow together again. We can rise together. We can all be part of a future yes. where America is winning again. But we have to do it together. So that's the last point I want to make. It's hard to have shared prosperity and a shared society if we don't have equal standing as citizens for the law. So this Supreme Court appointment is really good. And I think the president ought to make it. And if you nominate somebody qualified, which you will, the person ought to be confirmed. But what you need to know is not only have the Republicans promised not to do that, because they had a five to four majority that helped their politics. 
they have promised not to do it, and then the next president, in all probability, will get one or two more appointments, even if the president gets them confirmed. We cannot stand to have a Republican president, a Republican Congress, and a Republican Supreme Court. <laughs> we need a Supreme Court that thinks voting rights should be expanded, not restricted. belief belonging to a labor union is the right, and if you want to ride alone, you should at least pay for the services the union provides you. Yeah. We, need, we need a Supreme Court who wants to revisit Citizens United, which hung a for sale sign on the door of our democracy. Woo. I never thought I'd live to say, see the day, when the U.S. Supreme Court was saying the First Amendment's right of free speech includes the money in your pocket. <laughs> Which means, obviously, anybody can read the words, that the billionaire and the minimum wage worker are equally free to spend everything they want on politics. <laughs> <laughs> He's teaching that constitutional law. I can't say that. Even in the <laughs> we got to do this together. Which means the next president needs to be somebody who knows when to stand their ground and how to find a conflict. And that's it. My argument is simple. Hillary's the only person you can vote for in either party who has spent 40 years plus taking aggressive action to change other people's lives for the better. All right. From the time she got out of law school and went to work for the Children's Defense Fund, right. fighting the incarceration of juveniles in South Carolina, the wrongful claiming of tax credits for segregationist academies in Alabama, registering Mexican-American voters who were systematically kept out of the political system yes. in South Texas, woo, woo, woo. providing people in the Ozark Mountains their first access to the civil justice system in their lives. She's always been about making something good happen. Long before anybody knew anything about universal preschool, she came to see me once when I was governor, almost an issue or another constituent. <laughs> she said, you know, we got six of the poorest counties in America the 21st counties in America. You've got all these parents that can't read, they can't write. They don't know arithmetic, they know nothing. And their kids are gonna start school and they'll never catch up. I found a program in Israel for Ethiopian immigrants who don't speak Hebrew or English that teaches these people to do all that and in the process become their children's first teacher and they're doing great in school. I think it would work here. I said, sounds good to me, Henry, but what are we gonna do about it? She said, oh, I already did it. I called that lady in Israel. <laughs> no, I'm like, but this is starting some music. She'll be here in 10 days. Next thing you know, I'm being dragged around all these little preschool graduations with parents weeping because for the first time, they think they can do right by their kids. Today, all over this country, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people under 40 who started school ready to learn, went further, and are doing better because she always makes something good happen. That's what you need in the present. And this business in Clinton, Michigan made us all sick, and every Democrat was upset about it. But the mayor of Flint endorsed her because he said she was there early, she worked hard, and she always tried to make change. She assumed responsibility and left it for others to place the blame. And I think that's what you want in the press. Because yeah. I promise you, the minute you take your hand off the Bible, that blaming lasts about 15 seconds. <laughs> and people look at you and say, get the show on the road. That's what I heard you to fix. <laughs> when she moved to Washington, which is kind of la-la land, you know, further you get away from the voters, the more talking counts and doing it counts less. <laughs> Some people are even bored by doing it. I still find it rather fascinating myself. But anyway, we got beat on health care because we didn't have 60 votes in the Senate. You remember that when somebody tells you they're going to do this all over again. We worked from the end of World War II until President Obama had 60 votes in the Senate to pass health care. We lost. She didn't quit. She kept working 
with Senator Kennedy. They got something called the Children's Health Insurance Program put together, and we stuck it in the balanced budget bill so three quarters of the Republicans find that vote for. <laughs> there are now eight million kids in that program. It's a very important part of the Affordable Care Act. Then she did something I was, I still think in some ways it's the most amazing thing of all. She went to the guy in the pre Tea Party, Tea Party Congress who hated me the most, Tom DeLay. <laughs> They're enforcing. She strolls into his office, she said, Congressman, I know we don't agree on much. He said, Hillary, do we agree on anything? <laughs> she said, yeah, you love your kids, don't you? He said, what's that got to do with it? She said, your children are adopted, and I honor you for it. But this country is about to choke on a flood of kids aging out of foster care because people are afraid to adopt non-infant children and afraid to adopt children with special needs. And I want you to help me write a bill that gives a big tax credit for people who adopt non-infants and a bigger one for people who adopt special needs kids and give some more support to those families. They did it. And by the time I left office, there had been an 80% increase in adoptions out of foster care. She always makes a big Ohio is a big, interesting state. I remember when I ran for Congress, you had the best corn crop in Ohio I'd ever seen. Remember we took those little bus trips? And I'd make them stop every 10 or 15 miles. I mean, I'm from Arkansas. I said, I'm a, I never walked through a cornfield where I couldn't get through the soft sport. They were so big and thick. What's that got to do? She gets elected to a senator from New York. Nobody paid any attention to the New York economy outside New York City and the Collar counties. She decided she'd become the de facto governor of Long Island and upstate New York. So when she runs for re-election, the head of the local Farm Bureau endorsed her. And the press says, how can you do this? I thought you were a Republican. He said, I am. Well, why are you doing it? He said, look, all we got is family farmers, so everybody likes to brag on us. But of all the politicians we've ever dealt with, she is the only person who actually did something to help us do better. I'm for her. The guy had to retire, look at this, the guy had to retire to Florida because of a medical problem. Serious. And he's surviving and doing better. He came up to me and said, I'm so mad at Hillary. I saw him the other day. I said, why? He said, all these years I got to say, I'm a Republican right for her. Because of the way this primary works, I had to change my registration to Democrat so I could vote for her. Nine eleven happens. She got President Bush to give twenty billion dollars to New York so we could begin again. And I don't mean the buildings, I mean the people. She worked with John McCain, Lindsey Graham, all these Republican guys to make sure that our veterans deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq had protective gear. And when they came home, if they had traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress syndrome, they were properly cared for. If they were in the guard and the reserves, they got the same care that regular veterans got. She just made good things happen. Secretary of State, she got huge Republican support for getting our neighbors and friends to cooperate to reduce the number of terrorist citizens. She made a deal with Putin's Russia to reduce the risk of nuclear war by accident or intent. A good deal in a troubled world, wouldn't you agree? It required 67 votes in the Senate. That's a lot of Republicans. She got them. And I could go on and on and on. She called President Obama when he asked her to do it. She said, okay, I'll do this, but you got to give me all those tech wizards that you beat me with. <laughs> because we got to win the battle of the hearts and minds over the social media. Remember San Bernardino? That was a social media con. And that's why she's been the most forthright person in her party by saying, we do not dare to attack our fellow citizens who are Muslims because of their religion, we need their help to win the battle of the social media so we can win the promises as well. So, that's my pitch. When I met her, I thought she was the best doer I ever knew. 45 years ago this month. And I still think that. There have been lots of times in this election when I briefly wished that I had some more distance from her so you would believe what I'm saying. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I've been doing this a long time.
15 years of my foundation working around the world, being president the only period of shared prosperity in the last 50 years plus, being a governor that just literally grabbed the state by the throat and took 10 years to reorganize it so we can rise together. We can rise together. Yes. But you need a change maker. Go out and tell people that and win Ohio for, and she will be nominated and elected. Thank you.